In today's episode, we have one of the most successful mining executives and CEO of one of the more notorious mining stocks that's First Majestic Silver on the New York Stock Exchange. And Keith, one of the big, I would say, uh, influencers, if you could call Keith that, right? Because also, you know, highly sought after and longstanding successful executive. We're going to be talking about silver, gold, how the silver market is influenced by these socioeconomic, geopolitical environments, how inflation influences it moving forward. And we're going to be talking a bit about silver stocks as well. So make sure you hit the like button on this video. We will link the First Majestic website right there down below in the comments. Comment down below, go silver, go right there down below. And uh, Keith, it's good to see you. Yeah, Jake, it's uh, great seeing you as well. It's been some time. Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking yesterday, just to times when we talked and times when I talked to Rick and thinking about the things that you guys have, have said. And, and one of them is explaining how, especially silver particularly, it's like it always breaks out during so much confusion in the world. And right now the Federal Reserve just said inflation 7.5%, which I'm sure that you know might have been a little surprising to I know it was to me. I didn't expect them to say such big numbers. Then we see this Russia war type of stuff breaking out. What is your take on this rather confusing and it seems like high speed something just keeps happening new inflation number then germany's uh producer price index was like 25 percent, the highest since 1949 then the russia stuff happens silver skyrockets then it goes right down right after the russia incident but what's what do you make of all of it well geopolitically obviously you know the world is in quite a unusual i i don't actually remember you know so much uh um you know, issues going around the world, you know, the, the world seems to be so unstable right now. It's just, you know, you look at uh, Latin America, United States, Canada, you know, now, now Eastern Europe, um, Asia, you know, there's messes all over the place. Uh, you know, no wonder why the central banks have been buying so much gold over the last year or two. Uh, you know, obviously, they know there's something up and, uh, you know, this big reset or whatever is planned by these super elite uh, um, you know, maybe, maybe this whole Russian invasion was part of the plan. You know, who knows? Uh, uh, they seem to be leaving Putin alone, uh, despite the threats that they were, you know, uh, suggesting prior to this invasion. Now that he's invaded, they're all backing off and saying, OK, well, let's give it a month and see what happens. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's pretty strange. You just kind of wonder whether this is all just part of the whole game that all these politicians are playing. Yeah, I just wonder where the heck does the game go next? Uh, the, now, Hillary Clinton was on TV today saying we need to cyber attack them. And that's the last thing. I, I don't want a war, but I certainly don't want a cyber war. Uh, that does not sound good. And yeah. uh, I guess it just brings up, you know, you've seen Canadian bank freezes, all these types of things. And it just kind of brings back to the, I guess, the original idea of, of leaving the financial system, i.e. having real money, having silver. What do, you, what do you make of all that between cyber war, freezing banks, high inflation going off the charts? Uh, how does that tie back into silver? Well, it's a huge concern. And, uh, you know, it's a Canadian government came out and said the same thing today. You know, uh, prepare a message to the corporations within Canada you know, prepare yourself for a cyber attack from wow. Russia. Um, you know, whether this is a false flag, you know, who knows? But uh, I uh, read something just about a month ago that, um, you know, once this whole COVID thing kind of goes sideways and then and, and ends finally, and we can get back to some normality in our lives, um, that, you know, there's just some plan that uh, they're, they're, they're going to shut down, the governments are going to shut down the worldwide grid for two or three days, blaming it on sunspots. And basically, you know, turn all the electricity off. <laughs> you know, God, you know, hope, hopefully that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, there's some very odd things going on around the world right now. And, uh, um, you know, my daughter just asked, one of my daughters asked me yesterday, is her money safe in the bank accounts, you know, in, in her bank? And, uh, 
you know, I can't answer that question. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm try, I try to be optimistic and I am, you know, an optimist and, um, you know, hence, you know, I'm able to build companies and so on and I build them because I'm, you know, I think I'm adding value and think I'm, you know, bringing something to the human race. And you know, I look at, you know, what our staff has created, you know, one of the, you know, most respected silver companies on the planet and, you know, um, from scratch 19 years in, and you just kind of wonder, you know, what's really going on out there, you know, when you see these kinds of things and it creates a huge amount of concern for me. And, uh, you know, the direction that we're going as a human race is, is not particularly pleasing. I guess the one good thing is first majestic it, in a, uh, in a grid freeze, or as the Canadian government, you said, warned about cyber financial stuff. At least you guys have a lot of silver in the ground still. They can't really freeze that. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's something I've been worrying about a lot. So did the Canadian government put out a, a media release or did agencies contact big companies like yours or how did that work? No, it was a press release that came out this morning. I, I read it when I woke up this morning and, uh, you know, it's very much along the same lines as, you know, this whole cyber attack and, uh, you know, sunspots, whether it's sunspots, or whether it's the Russians or the Chinese or maybe it's the Americans doing it themselves. Uh, you know, who knows? But, um, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin. And, and uh, you know, because, you know, you lose electricity, you lose the Internet, your Bitcoin's worth nothing. And uh, uh, at least, you know, gold and silver, physical metal, um, you know, that's where it's at. And I continually tell people, you know, they have to have some of their money, some of their net worth in physical metal, uh, whether it's silver or gold. Um, you know, I, I, silver is in small quantities. It's easy to carry around. You know, God forbid if we actually need to use it to go buy something. But, you know, if it does get that bad, which, you know, you kind of wonder, you know, you, 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 who, who would have predicted what, what, you know, the last two years, you know, 10 years ago, you would have never predicted that. You know, would you ever predict that the Canadian government did what they did? Uh, you know, is, is this, is, is this um, you know, going to repeat itself in other countries around the world? Um, you know, Canada doesn't generally be the leader. You know, Canada is normally a follower and, and usually the United States is the leader. Um, for Canada to do, to something that they've done like they've done in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure what that means for our future, but I can't see it being very good. So, you know, you said that you're an optimist in that for the most part, you know, you're really focusing on what you can control, which is, you know, you said you started First Majestic Silver 19 years ago because you saw an opportunity there. Now, if you rewind to when you first started First Majestic, did you start it purely off of the projected supply demand fundamentals with the EV movement and renewables? Did you do it because you thought that it was important to um, have real money and, and, and in essence, leave the financial system? What was the motivation now compared to when you're looking at the way the world is moving currently? Yeah, I, I put to, put together, you know, one of the largest copper companies, you know, in the early 90s, um, you know, 92, 93. And uh, I left that company in 2000 and, and uh, I dabbled around in the Internet market and watch it, watch crash, crash, you know, uh, and as that, you know, dropped 80 percent over a period of, you know, three years from 2000, um, you know, into 2003, which really lit up the resource sector. And that was when gold was, you know, bottoming out in 2001, 2002 at uh, $250 an ounce and silver was down at five bucks an ounce. And, you know, I wanted to get back into the mining sector. And then I looked around and I thought about putting a gold company together, but um, there was just so many gold companies around. And, 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 you know, I'm a big believer in gold. I think everyone should have gold, but, you know, coming from a copper company, I'm really a supply demand fundamentalist. And uh, I, I, when I started looking at silver, I just was blown away by, by the supply demand story. And, and uh, um, you know, we didn't have EVs back then. We didn't have um, solar panels back then, you know, for the most part anyways. Um, uh, is, but I looked at cell phones. I thought cell phones was really the place, you know, I, I remember when the first cell phone from Motorola came out. You know, that's how old I am. So, you know, you know I, I remember black and white TVs, you know, color, color televisions, fax machines, you know, I witnessed all this stuff coming into being. Um, um, and, and uh, you know, this technology, I, I want to um, ride the technology wave because I'm a huge believer, 
in technology and the advances that technology and, and the benefits technology brings to the human race. And I and I just thought silver was a really good way to play the technology race. And uh, and since then, we've seen now two big markets, the EV market, which is taking up over 10 percent of world supply, uh, uh, approaching actually uh, likely 20 percent uh, this year, maybe uh, next year. But, you know, we're producing as an industry 800 million ounces of silver a year uh, in 2019, which is the last numbers I saw, because there wasn't any official numbers that came out in 2020, as far as I know. But we consumed 65 million ounces of silver in 2019, spread over 6 million electric cars. So, you know, you do the math and, and uh, I don't know what the 2021 numbers are. I'm dying to see them. But, you know, I saw an article um, out of an analyst in, in London about a month ago, and, and he's predicting that the solar panel industry is going to consume 140 million ounces of silver in 2022. Um, wow. you know, we, I don't know what the electric industry, electric car industry is going to consume, but you've got two brand new buyers of silver that are now consuming almost 30% of the world's supply of silver. And these buyers didn't exist a decade ago. Wow. Yeah, some of that math is is crazy. I, I was just doing math on the on the lithium market actually yesterday, mm. known globe global reserves versus like approximately eight um, kilograms in one battery. And I was just like toying around with the math. Uh, how many vehicles are there in the U.S.? How many are in China? How many are in the world? And then doing the math based off of where governments are making the mandates. And I do this math and I go, has anyone that is proposing these ideas done this math? And I think maybe Elon Musk might be the only one, you know, because he got in trouble for, you know, the, the supposed coup d'etat in Bolivia to try to control lithiums. And he also has the, they have a um, patent for uh, lithium ex extraction. And I'm like doing the math and I'm like, geez, look, like, the amount that is needed for the electric cars based off of these pretty much all these big governments whether it's eu canada a lot you know gavin newsom they're pretty much all by like 2030. well there's 280 million cars just in the united states there's another 280 million in china there's over 1.5 billion cars in the world and they say like they're all going to be electric by 2030 2040 and i'm doing the math on lithium i'm like like I almost felt like a like a smart ass in the back of the class, like, hey, uh, has anyone ever done this math before? And when you're saying that about silver, it's amazing because it's the exact same thing. You know, that's why I was always so much more interested in gold versus silver because of these supply demand things. For someone like me who's not a rocket scientist, I can just look at the math and be like, uh, this doesn't make much sense. And, oh, and that's why I say to people, you know, we need ten dollar copper prices. We need hundred dollar silver prices because, you know, the miners need the incentive to make the investment. And you, you, you know, the numbers that you know when during the lockdown lockdowns, I, I was doing research as well. And you know, there's about ninety five million automobiles produced every year. Uh, twenty twenty was obviously um, a low number, but um, on average over the last decade, that's approximately how many cars get produced each year. And, and there was only uh, 6 million cars, 6 million of the 95 million were electric cars. Wow. Yeah. So, so you know, if governments want to replace fuel combustion cars by 2030 or 2040, that's a big change. And, and uh, you, you, you know, you now see Audi and Volkswagen and, and you know, BMW and, you know, and of course the U.S. manufacturers as well. We're seeing more and more automobile companies producing electric cars. So that six million is probably a much bigger number because that's a bit of an old number, but uh, nevertheless, that's a ton of silver. And, uh, you know, if you, you know, it's about a kilo of silver per electric car. Okay. Um, you know, you'll never get that number out of the auto industry because they won't tell you, they're paranoid about <laughs> telling you because they don't want anyone to know what, what, what how much metal they're consuming. But, um, you know, the, to get a silver mine producing, it's a minimum of 10 years. So, and that's if everything goes really smoothly. So you, you drill a hole and you discover uh, economic silver, you're gonna drill it out over a period of four to five years to make sure there's enough silver there. At the same time, you'll be doing permitting, talking with the governments, you know, trying to you know, uh, get this thing done. Then you gotta finance the darn thing. Um, 
And then, then you're going to construct it and constructing, depending on the size, is going to take anywhere between three to five years. So from, from first discovery, it's a minimum of 10 years. Um, it, it, in, the, in the case of Ermitano, which is um, First Majestic's latest uh, producing mine, it just came on stream in November. That was six years from discovery. But we had a mill already built because it's only four kilometers away from our mill. So that was, you know, thank goodness we had that mill there uh, when we made that discovery. But if we didn't have the mill, we would now be in construction and it'd be another couple of years. So eight to 10 years. But a lot of mines, and that's Mexico. Mexico tends to be a bit of an easier jurisdiction. But if it's in Canada or the United States, you know, you're talking 15, 20 years. And sometimes if you're in Alaska, forget it, you'll probably never get a permit. So, you know, you could find a great asset, great ore body in Alaska and then, uh, you know, 50 years from now, if you're lucky, you might get a permit. So um, it's, you know, the miners won't spend the money to supply the industry with the amount of copper and silver that the industries need to, to, to follow the Green New Deal. It's impossible. Yeah, pretty much all of these countries have set, have set, California signed it into law by 2030. So when you're saying 95 million cars produced a year, I mean, they're essentially saying in the next 10 to 20 years, every one of those has to be electric. And I guess that's really the, the thesis behind it as a, as a serious silver investor like yourself, right? And, and yeah. so then I wonder, well, we know about the price manipulation. One of the weird things about silver in that regard is you have this unbelievable projected demand um, that similar to the lithium market. If you actually do the math, it's like you're going to need like, you know, triple that you're going to have to have triple dollar, so triple digit silver just to even get close to meeting any of these demands, which still would be impossible. And then to couple that, you don't have a natural price environment due to them, you know, in this fiat system, they can just issue the debt and do unlimited sell orders. So then it gets distorted even more. So it kind of creates like a perfect storm, right? Like, because there's so much industrial demand from it, but when the price is manipulated, doesn't it just, it can be more frustrating in the short term, but in the long term, doesn't that make it more of a perfect storm? Well, for sure. You know, at, at some point, you know, it'll break, right? You know, it, it you know, you're talking about uh, the 95 million cars. And I mentioned earlier, you know, about, you know, 6 million cars consume 65 million ounces of silver wow. in 2019. So, you know, I, I, I could easily do the math, but, uh, you know, some people can do it themselves. But, you know, that turn, that works out to a, an awful lot of silver, more more than uh, we're producing, probably. And, uh, um, you know, where, where does that break? At some point, the manipulators who bang the heck out of, the metal yesterday, it was one of the most amazing days I've ever seen, um, you know, where we had a hundred dollar move in gold up and down and uh, silver, you know, went through 2550 and then broke through 24. And today it's actually a gain below 24. It's just, you know, that doesn't happen in a natural market. So, you know, these people that are playing this game have no clue about really the fundamentals of the physical demand in the market. You know, these are guys in high towers on Bay Street just trading numbers on a computer screen. Uh, and, and, and these markets tend to be quite illiquid. They're easy to move around. You know, you, you know the entire silver market, you know, is, is, you know, you do the math, 850 million ounces are produced a year times, you know, 25 bucks or 24 bucks. You know, they, 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 you know that's, just, you know, Apple could buy the entire silver industry probably with, with you know, pocket change. Um, but, you know, they, but yet we trade a billion ounces a day in the paper markets, and we only produce 850 million ounces a year, or 800 million ounces a year. So you know, the, 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 you know that's you know a lot of leverage in a market, and you know the paper market, you know, has control over pricing, which is itself, um, you know, it shouldn't be. You know, it, you know the miners and industry should be um, in, in, involved in pricing. You know, based on true supply supply demand fundamentals. You know, we see that in the uranium market. You know, we see it in the oil market. You know, these markets are, you know, are, are, are you know, much more legitimate markets um, than, than the precious metals markets. Yeah. Thinking about that math, 95 million cars annually, you said about six, six 
million. 65 million. 65 million uh, was how much? Over 6 million cars, yeah. Yep, that comes out to about 65 million ounces. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So you you do the math on that. If if every electric car in the world, I mean, then you basically have already got the entire annual supply of silver. And and I look, it's the same thing that happened to me when I did the. I never done the math like that on lithium. And you look at silver. That's one minute area that it's presently used for would take up the whole supply. And it makes me go. They're all saying we're going to this this huge push towards electrification of the world, but it seems like every commodity in the world is headed for like price breaking numbers because no one's done the math on how much of these commodities are going to be needed to supply these types of demands and and mandates and this general vision that they want to take it. Right. Yeah. And, and, And in a world where governments don't want any extractive industry, so, so, you know, look, look at, the, you know, what uh, the U.S. did with the oil pipelines, uh, you know, they shut them down. So, and, and, and mining sectors looked at as, you know, a dirty industry and, uh, um, you know, there's lots of, you know, uh, pressure on the mining sector and it's harder and harder to get permits. It's harder and harder to, you know, even explore for metal, you know, it, it, you know, um, you know, getting a drill rig permitted is, is, is in itself a challenge. So, you know, if, if you've got, higher demand and, 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 and less supply and governments are, don't want to mine in their backyard, you know, where's this metal going to come from? And I said, you know, throughout the last you know, decade, you know, we're going to end up mining waste dumps, you know, all, all those televisions and, and uh, refrigerators and stoves and microwave ovens that we buried in, in landfills around the planet. Um, you know, if, if governments don't let the miners go and actually do mining, where are we going to get the metal? We're going to have to, we're going to, have to go into dumps. And, uh, you know, this cell phone here, this is an Apple uh, 10. And, uh, you know, it's probably got uh, five bucks worth of silver in it. But it's it's uneconomic to recycle it because these high-tech companies are so good at embedding this metal into these circuit boards that, they're, that you can't get it out. You know, you can burn it out, but then you create too much pollution. And, and the Chinese have shut down a bunch of uh, uh, smelters that used to do that work. They used to be a huge importer of computer waste, uh, but due to their cleanup of their air and so on, uh, they've been shutting down smelters. So you can't even ship computer waste to China anymore. So all this computer waste is now accumulating on surface from North America and Europe, and there's no home to send all this computer waste to because none of the smelters are willing to take it because the amount of um, you know pollution it creates. So um, you know, we don't have the technology to get the metal out of these devices that we've created. Uh, and it all comes down to price. If silver was $100 an ounce, then maybe there it would be economic to recycle, you know, silver and copper out of computers, you know, out of cell phones. But right now they're just thrown away uh, because we have nothing to do with it. Is there a point at which, since there's so much industry demand for silver and you just laid the math out whether it's electric car companies or it's all these various solar big panels solar panels and all the various big tech phones and whatnot is there a point at which there's such a constraint on the market that they essentially for lack of better terms demand that the price rises to incentivize new mining because they need the price higher because the availability is so short i mean you know, it's it's the banks have control over the over these markets, right? So so the banks will, yeah. You know, if if they wake up one day and say, hey, by the way, you know, we're wrong in our thesis, um, then things change. You know, we you know that the, the press there's a announcement you probably saw it. It came out uh, four to six weeks ago, whereby um, Bank of America is apparently short eight hundred million ounces of silver. Uh, you, did, did you happen to see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's shocking. I, and I can't even imagine a bank taking a, a short position like that. It sounds so like, why would a bank take that much risk? And and, and silver was below, um, uh, well, it was at least 2 or $3 below where it's currently trading at. So the loss on that trade right now is is quite astronomical. It's probably in the billions of dollars. So, you know, who maybe was them? You know, the silver broke through 25.50 yesterday. And these guys in New York are panicking. And uh, 
who knows? Like, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you know, if you're short that much of anything, and then it's going against you, you know, um, wouldn't you try to knock it down? Whether it's a stock or whether it's anything, it doesn't matter what it is. You're gonna because it's you're you're trying to protect your investment. You're trying to protect your book. And uh, yet, you know, the regular just sit, sit aside and let these kinds of games happen. But eventually, I think industry is going to crack the whole thing open. And I think that Elon Musk, um, being being the guy he is, you know, we've already seen him de dealt his hand. You know, he's he's played in the lithium space. He's now played in the nickel space. You know, I personally believe that within probably a decade, um, that the big high tech companies will likely own several key mines around the world um, and they'll be um, dealing with their own supply and they'll be right outside of the COMEX. They won't even be trading in the COMEX market. They'll just have their supply. And what that ultimately is going to do is that'll break the COMEX because the, um, the what makes the whole banking trade or the COMEX work is there is physical metal in the system. So they can leverage that physical metal and they kind of know when it's going to come in. They kind of have a feel for what's being produced and they you know they they run the math and they could run um their 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 risks on on their positions and, and how leverage they could get and so on and so forth but if you take the physical metal out of the system which i think will ultimately happen because the high-tech companies will own the metal through their own production because they'll own the mines the entire comex collapses because it just is a paper market at that point and no one cares about it because all the supply is being consumed by industry and they've got direct supply. Wow, that's interesting. Then what would happen? Well, it'd be great for the miners because um, I think all of a sudden the big hedge funds and pension funds around the world will try to front run the tech companies. And uh, the second a tech company goes in and buys a, buys a mining company, and can you imagine uh, you know, Tesla taking out First Majestic? You know, that would light up the world. That would Every mining stock on the planet would probably go up 50 to 100 percent just because people would think okay well who's going to be the next buyer <laughs> it, it sounds like, a little pure, uh pure it's, speculation jake but uh, well it's pretty interesting it sounds like on first take a little out there but then once you actually look at the math and everything that we talked about yeah, you like, start to go just rationally deducing logic out of out of a a linear format you go well it seems like it will have to happen at some point. They're going to need to do things like that, right? Yeah. Well, why why give all that money to the banks? You know, like the like the miners are giving money up to the banks. The the, the tech companies or the consumers are giving money up to to the banks. So you know, if you're a high tech company that cares about margins, uh, wouldn't you try to own the entire stream? Like for a mining company, the best thing you you would own like and all the big majors all the big conglomerates they own a smelter they own a refinery and uh some even own mints in, in, in a couple of cases um and and they own the entire supply chain from the, from the time it gets produced to the end consumer and um uh you know if you're a high-tech company why wouldn't you want to do the same do you think that someone like elon is thinking about that like i'm trying to imagine if you met him and you and you said all that to him what he would say well he obviously knows there's an issue with nickel and lithium yeah uh, but he hasn't figured out the silver story uh because the silver story is as critical as any metal as you pointed out earlier um so i don't know if exit strategy is the right word but do you think that when you're looking down the line, like way down the line at First Majestic, are you expecting one day when, when you are retiring that it ends with a, one of these big companies buying you guys or what? Yeah, you know, it, it, you can't ever plan for, for, at least in my opinion, an exit strategy. You know, like I, I've been in the mining sector for 35 years and I've never had a company bought from out, out from underneath me. Oh. Yeah, but I know other people that have had two or three companies bought out from underneath of them. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say. You know, at, at, at our size, there's not that many companies out there that could buy us, um, you know, uh, um, other than other than a high tech company. Another mining company would likely yeah. not take us out because we're just too big. 
but um, but for an app for an Apple, you know, it's pocket change. That's going to be interesting to watch what happens. It's it's like I was just thinking. There's so many different crises that are occurring or starting to occur, all different types of things. And I was thinking like the miscalculation of commodities is going to be a serious crisis once they realize like how much is needed. What's going to happen? Yeah, well, according to uh, what's his name? Uh, um, the Davos guy. Oh, oh, oh nothing. Schwab. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, well, you're gonna sell. You're gonna Klaus Schwab. He'll take over oh, yeah. first Probably. majestic silver. He'll yeah. he'll be the C. I'll be interviewing him. <laughs> so, um, first majestic. Uh, Mexico is like one of the only sane countries left. Mexico, I in a lot of ways. I I, I mean, I'll. You know, no offense to Canada, but. Uh, <laughs> I'd be I'd be in Mexico before Canada myself uh, from a from a living perspective. You know, it's stayed relatively, uh, relatively sane, you know, um, and a relatively stable, uh, especially political environment to me, more so than someone would ordinarily think. It seems like it's it's worked out quite well. What's going on? Have you been pleased with with all of that, first of all? And what's the latest updates on First Majestic? Well, you know, Mexico is not what it was 19 years ago. It, it's, um, you know, it is quite a bit different. Um, security is is uh, always a bit of a concern. You know, the, you know, the cartels and you know the the, the, the corruption that's um, present um, within Mexico is 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 you know elevated. You know, compared to what it was. You know, when we first put the business together, it's manageable. Um, uh, and, and look, it's a great place to be. Um, uh, good people, you know, hardworking people. You know, workforces are available. Um, if you need, you know, a few hundred people, you know, they're there, um, um, and at a reasonable cost. Um, uh, you know, food's good. The weather's good. You know, we we have a mine in Nevada. Uh, we just bought last year in in in, in um, Jared Canyon. It's called, as many of your listeners probably know. But um, we're learning how to mine in snow. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, because you know, uh, up, up in Alto, Nevada, it actually gets quite cold in the winter and it does snow. And uh, you know, we've never had uh, a mine in, in uh, you know that kind of environment before. And uh, you know, we've always been quite blessed with um, you know having mines in, in warm climates and you know being able to operate 365 days a year and you know have you know rarely have any freezing. You know, we've had odd events, but uh, not as regular as we do at Jared Canyon. So it's it's a learning curve. Um, but no, I think you know we're we're looking at you know, on M and A front. You know, if something came up that was interesting for us in Mexico, we would definitely still look at it, despite you know some of the challenges. You'll definitely want to keep taking your business trips to Mexico over over the snow. I love yeah, Mexico. I really do just to warm up. Yeah. So, um, what's what's the latest? First majestic. I, I know you're always. I know your goal is to be if not the one of the you know biggest mining companies out there even outside of the silver space you know i know where your head's at and your ambitions at so uh, how's everything going and and where's your head at yeah well look we had a, a record 2021 um uh production year um you know costs are a little you know there's some inflation so you know we are dealing with with some some issues there and uh you know, we're we're still adopting new technologies and lo looking for ways to grind down costs, and you know that's just an ongoing effort, and that uh, will continue to be that way. But uh, you know, 2022 is going to be an another record year. We're expecting about a 30 percent growth year over year, which is you know pretty wow. substantial. Uh, so, and in 2023, 2024 is looking really good. Um, you know, we produced um, somewhere around 24 million ounces of silver equivalent in 2021. Uh, that number is going to reach uh, uh, around 27, 28 million ounces in 2022. And uh, by 2024, we're expecting to break through 50 million silver equivalent ounces. A lot What's of your goal. goal? What's like your big ambition? Well, th that's on paper. You know, that's our that's our budget. So, you know, it, it's um, I don't throw that out lightly. You know, these are numbers that we're actually shooting to accomplish. What's like your big ambition? Like your big, ten, I, I don't know, we call it 10-year 
20 year vision or career vision with, with where to take it. With you know, I think 50 million houses is a, is a nice target. Um, you know, when I put, I, when I put together the company, you know, uh, originally, uh, my goal was to get to 10 million houses. Um, oh, wow. we got, we, you know, we got there within 10 years and, uh, now we're 19 years in and uh, we're at, you know, heading towards 27, 28 million. It's, it's, um, it's exciting. Um, you know, we want to be the largest uh, silver producer in the world out of the primary silver mines anyways. And, uh, um, you know, that's a big task. Uh, we're going to probably need to make a couple other strategic moves to, to accomplish that. And then we're always working to, uh, you know, achieve that. Um, I'd seen your, someone peeking in a couple of times, so I don't want to oh, really? take up too much of your time, but I wanted to ask you if you've got another minute, um, yep. I wanted to ask you, so mining companies are, it's, it's interesting because there's obviously so many commodities and things that can be mined. And then in the publicly traded markets, you know, then there's so many companies that come about from it and so many people that try it. And, um, you know, a lot of people never produce one ounce, you know, in their whole career, you know, let alone even having a goal of producing 10 million or a lot of people, they say their goal, but they say it in terms of reserves, not in terms of, um, the amount of mined ounces. Mm -hmm. And so you're in this, I mean, let alone to even have the goal to produce 10 million ounces is a lot, but then achieve that go 27, 28 million. Why do you think that you've been able to be so successful at doing this? Well, first off, it's, it's, you know, having a vision, of course, and then, um, you know, it all starts there and then having good people, uh, you know, around the business. And, uh, you know, we, we've been blessed by having some very strong people, you know, as part of my team. And, and, uh, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, adding, adding talent all the time as we grow the business. And, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges is just continually adding new talent. And, uh, you know, the company's considerably larger than it was a decade ago. And, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have grown uh, as it has without the people involved. Uh, so, you know, it's just motivating, getting people to work um, all towards the same direction. And uh, it's amazing, you know, how, you know, you get a couple hundred people uh, all working together on the same task. Uh, you know, it's amazing what can be accomplished. And, um, you know, I've been successful in, able, in, in, in uh, being able to, um, you know, motivate people in, in order to uh, work together because it all takes, it's all team, it's all a team effort always. Was it weird looking back and seeing you guys just produce 25, 26 million and thinking that your guys' original goal was to your, your ultimate big, huge goal, which was a big, huge goal was to get to 10 million and be like, Oh, wow. We sort of shot past that. Like, was it weird to look at that? Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's it's. I remember in two thousand four, we bought. Just you guys time. have a big company. That's that's uh, you know. Yeah, well, you know, over six thousand employees, and uh, um, so no, look in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2004, uh, we bought our first mine in January, and we were in modest production by October that year. So we rebuilt the mill and, and so on and so forth. We produced twenty five thousand ounces of silver in our first year. Oh, wow. Twenty five thousand ounces of silver, like. That's nothing. That's right? crazy. Uh, but you know, that was that was a big deal, you know, and, and it got a lot of people excited. And uh I was able to raise a substantial amount of money over the following couple of years mm -hmm. in order to, you know, make the uh strategic uh, M A moves that we did to be able to build the portfolio. And I was lucky to have a couple of real key uh professionals, you know, at my side looking at assets and you know, going through Rolodexes and uh and just you know picking and choosing and you know, every move we made didn't work, but, but, uh, we made a lot of moves and, and a lot of right moves and, uh, we bought some great assets and, uh, uh, you know, within a very short period of time, we, you know, we started producing, you know, four or 5 million ounces a year, which just kind of built upon itself and, uh, breaking through 10 million ounces was obviously a huge milestone. Uh, within the sector, the, one of the obviously most successful and, and, and legendary investors is is Eric Sprott, you know, multi-billionaire natural resource investor. 
Um, his, I'm not sure if it's his largest investment in any company or if it's just his largest investment in a silver company. But first of all, you can correct me on that. No, any, um, in any largest. company, period. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Eric mining Sprott's company. mining. Yeah, correct. In in any mining company that Eric Sprott is invested in, the largest is First Majestic. Um, Obviously, I imagine that Bill <laughs> is probably pretty cool. But what I what I was thinking about is um, one of my friends was together with him on a fishing trip pretty recently, and he said, and I said, "Well, what would you guys talk about?" And he said, "Well, he only wanted to talk about silver." I, I, and he's, I was like, "Did you ask him anything else?" He, yeah, like I tried to. Some other, he's just like, "No, he just wanted to talk about silver." Yeah, no, that's that's definitely Eric, and. Uh... You know, I, I, I have him on the phone you know, every once in a while and, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, no, he's he's promoting me all the time. So and, and I, I'm the last guy he needs to promote, but uh, he comes up with the most fascinating tidbits of information that, uh, you know, I, I don't get from anyone else except him. So uh, it's pretty good. And you yeah, guys we, we, we got a, We've got a great relationship and yeah, it's it's great to have him on board. And uh, we're co-invested in a couple of companies as well. And uh have been for you know 20 years and so i i assume uh, without needing to say you guys are both in the triple digit silver camp mm -hmm. despite the fact i i coined the phrase so. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we can get the lawyers to draft draft that up for you okay, it's okay. so more and more people that say it the better because eventually <laughs> eventually everyone will start believing it maybe maybe it'll actually happen yeah, maybe we'll do it that way. All right. So everyone comment down below, triple digit silver. We're going to link First Majestic website, catch catch them on uh, the major stock exchanges. We'll, we'll link Keith's Twitter and First Majestic Twitter and all that type of stuff like that too. Keith, is there anything else that, uh, you know, I had you, I had you for a while, so I apologize. I know you're already late for a haircut and I don't look like you know, you're in your office and some people I, work. I think I'm going to have to phone them and reschedule. But <laughs> I, I, I leave tomorrow and uh, we've got the Connor conference coming up next week. So uh, I was hoping to look a little bit better for the conference, but uh, maybe that's not going to happen. So uh, anything, any, any last thing that you, um, that I missed or anything that first majestic that I missed or anything? Yeah, no, I look, with? it's, uh, you know, I think that, that I think that, uh, you know, the, the wind behind our sails um, is definitely there. Um, uh, you know, the, the governments seem to want to continually print uh, paper, which is uh, great for gold. And, and uh, you know, all, I guess the political you know, instability, despite the fact that I don't really like to see all the inst instability, I guess it, it does, um, you know, I guess it's good for gold prices. It's not exactly why you want to see gold moving. I'd rather see it move for other reasons. Um, uh, but, you know, I think silver will, you know, I'll, you know eventually... The big money is going to wake up to silver, and you start to, starting to see it. Um, and I think that um, you know silver will you know ultimately be the star and outperform gold. And you know, I think people just need to be positioned right, whether that's your choice is physical or whether it's the miners. Um, you know, it's it's up to you know their people's own investment criteria. But uh, definitely should have some exposure in silver. It's it's uh, it's a very interesting commodity. I've called it the strategic metal. Uh, you know, if, if uh, the human race wants to electrify itself in the ways that we are talking about doing. Um, you know, we're going to need a lot more silver, and we're going to need a higher, much much higher silver prices in order to incentivize the miners to mine the mine the stuff because we're just simply not mining enough silver today. Well said. Thank you very much. Enjoyed this conversation. It was good to see you, Keith. And we want to thank everyone for listening today. Make sure you hit that like button on this video. Give us that triple digit silver comment right there down below. You can check out the First Majestic website and we will see you on the next video.